deal. Oh, I'm already, I've already been driven crazy. These are our chemical senses. So much like the inner ear, our mechanoreceptors, they kind of deal with vibration. And we have uh, that, that organ of corti, this long organ of corti, depending upon where it vibrates, you get high pitch sounds versus low pitch sounds, yes? Mm -hmm. And then depending upon the number of actual potential sent per unit of time, we get loud sounds versus quiet sounds, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and then in the ears, you get your macula sacculi, macula utriculi, they deal with lateral movements, with Forwards and backwards, right, left, that's macula utriculi, and then up and down, macula sacculi. They help us deal with the vibrations of movement, if you will, in a similar fashion. They all have hair cells. And then the rotation of the head is dealt with by our crispy angularii, uh, and their little cupolas on top that are found inside the ampules of our semicircular canals. Hopefully, all this rings some sort of a bell. They all deal with vibration in essence. What we're doing now is we're changing here. So we have photoreception or phototransduction done by our rods and cones. We have mechanoreception in essence done by our inner ear apparatus. And now we're moving into the realm of chemoreception. Special senses dealing with chemoreception. And this would be olfaction and gustation. Olfaction being smell, gustation being taste. Uh, and for these two functions, there must be an aqueous solution in place that chemicals are capable of dissolving into that will give you the ability to test these chemicals and diagnose their properties. It's a fancy way of saying your ability to smell and taste must have some sort of aqueous solution that things can dissolve into. For taste, that's easy. What do we have? Saline. Saline, you salivate. You can look at good food and make it salivate. Yes, your body's preparing for it, and that saliva of chemicals from the food that you consume will dissolve into said saliva and lead you to having certain flavors interpreted in your brain. Absolutely factual. Uh, and then in smell, what do you have in your nose? Your hairs and mucus. Mucus is what we're looking for, though. There's a thin <laughs> layer of mucus on the roof of your nostrils. And if it's too thick, you got problems. Too thin, you got problems. You have to have an appropriate amount of this fluid like mucus in the top of your nasal passages for you to be able to dissolve chemicals into it and then have the ability to smell. So, this is how chemoreception works. There must be a mild fluid medium in which things can be utilized. And some people are just better at it than others, you might say. Like this fella here, he is indeed a sommelier, as we were describing previously. He has the best job ever. What does he do? He drinks wine and tells you about it. Professional wine taster. This is Oswald Clark. He's living the good life. He's very famous for living the good life. Um, and he's talented at what he does. Like the, the art of wine tasting and pairing doesn't seem that fancy to you. I'm here to tell you that what this guy's capable of would freaking blow your mind, all right? So he lives in the UK, and he'll get a phone call from a vineyard in France. Like, we'd like to invite you down for a weekend at our vineyard. You're going to taste all of our wines, and we'll pay you X amount of dollars. And enjoy yourself. Just help us make sure that we have the best products capable. So they fly him down, and they pay him money to drink their wine. What a great job. What a great job. But here's the rub to this. Like, taste. He's like, is this grown on a north facing slope? And they're like, yes. He goes, pick them a little too soon. The heat's getting to them. You gotta wait a bit, you know, let some sugar mature. That's why you got this tannic flavor going here. And he's like, 
Yeah, you did this on over two, didn't you? You got too much oak on this. You gotta let it sit in the casks a little less time because you're getting too much of a, like, yes ma'am. Hi there, oh, how are you? Good to see you. Good, good to see you. Indeed. I tried to catch you this morning and then I got had a hectic morning. So I'm here and I still get to meet with you all being the library when you have time. Uh, one hour from right at this moment. Okay. Thank All right, you. see you soon. Sorry about that. No problem. Online student. Mm. Exciting. Uh, I didn't know we were meeting today, but that's fine. <laughs> Moving on. Surprise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's crazy is it took me a minute to figure out who it was. So I was like, oh, I see you on Zoom. That's how I know. Mm. Yeah, that's how that works. Uh, yeah, 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 he, he's like, he pastes this wine, man, he's like, uh, you got big rocks in your soil, don't you? I'm like, yes, he goes, they're holding too much heat, you got problems, you gotta get some of that rock out of the soil or bust it up. Like, that's the level we're dealing with here, folks. Like, I watched him one day, and this is hilarious, just for fun, they think. He's swimming around, you know, having a good time at this uh, this crazy lake, and they take all these wines and line them up, he swims up and they'll take a sip, and he goes, that's a... Uh, old vines of Mendel from this region of California. So he's swimming around, he picks it up and goes, oh, that's a, a Grand Cru Champagne from this particular town in France. And he's right, like he's right. It's crazy. Like it's an amazing talent in reality that is to be expected. No different from like Renoir painting, all right? Pretty impressive. You got right. nose on him anyway. Yeah, that's, that's it, that's, that's it. Well, what you're gonna find is- Lots of room. What you're gonna find is your sense of taste is quite limited, whereas your sense of smell is sky's the limit. I think we're all about the same in our capacity for flavor interpretation, but smell, some of us are quite different, all right? Quite different in terms of our capacity for smell, with Osmark being uh, one of those high percentages. You know, he's, he's up top in terms of his capacity for interpretation of smell. And if you want to get an idea of what I'm talking about, I would invite you. All right, I love me some good movies, man. Uh, the sequel to Silence of the Lambs was Hannibal, mm -hmm. right? And in that movie Hannibal, mm -hmm. uh, they get a letter from Hannibal Lecter, and they give it to these professional smell people who smell the letter and can tell them exactly where it came from. These people are real. Okay? These humans exist, and it's pretty amazing. So let's go through and talk about it. First things first, let's talk about smell. Uh, all of this should look remarkably familiar to you at this stage. You know that you have a brain, and on the bottom of your brain are olfactory bulbs. You saw them in the dissection images. You should be best friends with this at this stage. Uh, and those olfactory bulbs lay down on cribiform plates that you saw a long time ago at this stage. And then they have bipolar neurons. Remember bipolar neurons involved in your special senses. They have bipolar neurons that fall down into your nasal epithelium and give you the capacity for smell. And notice that the little uh, branching networks here, these and acids, dendrites, receptors is what they are. They are in a fluid in this particular passage. That is the mucus, that nasal mucus that we've been talking about. Uh, and there was something else about that. Oh, this is about the shortest passage in the body between the outside world and your brain. And it's also a site of attack by certain parasites, interestingly. You ever heard of the brain-eating amoeba? Mm -hmm. It's actually called Intero amoeba solidica. Okay. Uh, and what will happen is if you're swimming in fresh water and there's benthic sediments that have been stirred up, kids kicking around, you know, this is terrifying. You ready to be terrified? Yes. Kids kick around benthic sediments, bottom sediments. Uh, at about one per meter square in any lake in Alabama, or anywhere for that matter, there will be at least one into a One per meter uh, square. One per square. Uh, and in normally warm situations, uh, they can be upwards of 100 per square meter, okay? So it's square meter, you know, it's about like this. If you're splashed and the water goes up your nose and that intermediate histolytica gets up into your nose, it'll find these passages, chew its way through into the brain and kill you within about five days. There's no curing it. We just don't make it like this, so. Uh, people die every year as a result of this. Even in like poorly maintained water parks and stuff, you see this happen from time to time. And it's this is like terrifying and sad and awful in every possible way, but folks die every year from it. And what I'm telling you is, 
just be leery of being in a situation where water might splash up your nose and scuff your face. All right, just be leery. Like this is not something you want to do. All right. And here. I miss that. I miss that. Like don't. <laughs> Like even if you're just swimming in the water? Uh, yeah, I'm totally swimming. <laughs> okay, uh, do I have to? Is it a too? Uh, I'm sure it does. But, I mean, they don't want to do this to you. Like, it's not their goal in life. They don't reproduce in this fashion. It's just, like, they do it because they're critters and they don't know where they're at. Like, they're basic organisms. They're just chewing up on the ground down here. But they'll get after you, too, given an opportunity. And it just so happens that this is a tender enough spot to allow that. Uh, I had a boss that worked on a normally enriched lake. It was an output from a power plant. And I forget what they were doing, but they were out there having to work. He said that in the morning, they would bring big long socks and put eggs in the socks and hang them over the output from the um, uh, power plant. And they would cook the eggs. They would have breakfast out there while they were working. He said that they carried a little, you know, the little nasal um, inhalers. They had those with a mild bleach solution in them. And if they were ever splashed in the face, they had to hit themselves in the nose with this mild bleach solution because there were like hundreds and thousands of these amoebas per square meter. Uh, they were heavily enriched in that particular location. So to keep from dying, they had to keep that in their pocket all the time. I'm gonna send that light that's in the lake, right? Yep. Not a pool. Pools hopefully don't have those. I just won't get in the lake then. <laughs> Yes. Stay on the boat. Kids died within the last decade in North Carolina as a result of uh, amoeba contamination. Sit here, please. Yeah, what's worse is, uh, like, you're going to have to do this to you all the time. We went to a lake with another family, and everybody splashed around having a great time. But I'm, like, really diligently teaching my kids from laying down and, like, playing in the Adventure 7 so they with their kids and they're having a great time. And the other parents, they're like, yeah. The helicopter thing. And I'm like, it's a side effect of what I do for a living. I know what can happen. So would you let me tell you what can happen? And she goes, nope, I don't want to hear a word about it. I'm not going to tell you what can happen. So, yeah. I warned you know. All right. Uh, yeah, this, this is a good place. So, when you're normally just tidal breathing, is what this is called. So, what the hell is tidal breathing, I guess? Right? You're just breathing, tidally. Tides go in, tides come out. This is how you breathe. Do we all agree? Right? When you're tidally breathing, you tend to breathe through your nose, and air takes the path of least resistance. Kind of comes in your nasal passages, comes around and then down towards your lungs, uh, through your tracheal passages, tidal breathing. But what you may notice is that every now and again, you might perceive mild chemical influence. That's a fancy way of saying you smell something. And if you want to know what that is that you smell, what do you do? You go. Yes? Yes. It's when I walk into my kid's room. Like, you know, trying to find what the heck it is. You sniff for a reason. The reason you sniff is because it dramatically increases the velocity of air entering the nair as the opening of the nasal passages. And when you increase the velocity, instead of the air just going straight down to your lungs, it fires up and slams into the nasal epithelium. It really slams into it. So if there are any heavy chemicals there that are going to be heavier than the air, obviously, uh, they're going to slam into the nasal epithelium and the next bombard of mucus that's there with the chemicals that are found in the air you're breathing in. Think about like a cologne or something like that. What that's going to do is you spray yourself down with it. You're my brother, especially. Spray yourself no, down. God. And it's going to slowly evaporate off your system. Like, I could take uh, some sort of scent and just... <laughs> Such a dumb comment. I was spread on this table. And in a period of time, everybody in the room could smell it because it's going to slowly evaporate off. And the next time you come in, if you put your nose right against the spot, you won't smell anything because it's all gone. Everybody with me? It's all diffused into the air. What's happening is those chemicals are getting into the air and you are sniffing them, you're smelling them, it's time for crisis. Um, because you're slamming those chemicals into your nasal epithelium. And again, it will dissolve into that nasal epithelium, bind two receptors that are there, go through the propofol plates into the olfactory bulbs, and then be channeled into the brain for interpretation. And interestingly, these are non-myelinated neural tracts. There is no myelin found here. Why? What does myelin do? Speeds up transmission speed. Do you need fast transmission speeds? The neurons are that long. 
probably not. Uh, so there are, there's a mile here. You gotta remember that in areas where you need to lose quick speed, you're gonna invest into swarm cells. So in areas where you don't need fast transmission speed, you're gonna lose speed. So there are no swarm cells, no mile here. Let's go here. Uh, humans can distinguish, some, distinguish somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10,000 different odors. Uh, you have a multitude of different smell genes, and you would be amazed at just how good you actually are at it. All right, our sense of smell is remarkably sensitive. Like, you don't think about us as having a really sensitive sense of smell, but we can pick up like parts per million. It's pretty incredible in essence. And, and most animals are capable of this. Most critters have a really good sense of smell. I mean, obviously some animals have more powerful senses of smell, and we're gonna get to that here in a little bit, but we are not amateurs, all right? Our sense of smell works pretty damn up good in the grand scheme of things. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So binding of an odor. Yeah, yeah, this is important. Yeah, this is important. All right, here we go. When you bind an odorant to your receptors for smell, they open up their gated ion channels and allow sodium and calcium to flow into the receptor. Let me say that again, because it matters. Sodium and calcium flow into the receptor. And that's a problem. Sodium's easy to deal with. What do we have? So again. Sodium is easy to deal with because what do we have in most every cell in our body? We got sodium, sodium calcium. calcium pumps. Okay, we've got sodium calcium pumps. Real easy to deal with sodium. We've got calcium. I mean, calcium is notoriously difficult to deal with. I mean, your cervical reticulum has calcium western just to hold on to calcium, right? Like calcium is complicated. It's difficult to deal with. So it leads to a very interesting nuance to your sense of smell. Something that your sense of smell can do that other uh, special sense receptors can't. And that's called olfactory adaptation. Okay, olfactory adaptation. What happens is this. When you smell something, you build up sodium and calcium inside of your scent receptors. The calcium stays, the sodium gets cleared. Okay, you clear the sodium, the calcium remains. So if you keep sniffing, the calcium builds up even more. The sodium gets removed, the calcium builds up. And eventually, it leads to such a high gradient of calcium buildup in these receptors that the receptors lose their ability to depolarize. So they stay, uh, in essence, cut off, okay? Until lots of time passes, five or 10 minutes, away from the odor so that you can slowly clear the calcium out of the receptors. Now, bear with me. This is why you can bust up into a room that smells bad, and then after four or five minutes, don't notice it anymore, right? You adapt, your olfactory system will adapt, which is very important for you in terms of staying alive, because you are you know, living in an area where there's lots of like, potent smell. You don't want that to overwhelm your sense of smell, because being able to perceive a lion or a tiger or some other big predator, that's important. It's important. You don't realize it because we don't think about it these days, but it's really important. So in essence, you clear all scents from the environment so that if anything new comes in, you can perceive it. Yeah. Um, is this kind of like when you have a certain washing powder and you get used to it? Sure. Sure. Why not? Okay. I would. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do they talk to you that have to like? Yeah, I don't know. I've never heard of that. Because these are very independent. Like your capacity to smell different things is quite independent. So if you're like living in a freaking coffee shop, you can still, you know, perceive smells of other things. Uh, and just in that fact, I think it's really all up to you. I don't know. No, like the um, little. Oh, I know. I've seen it. The co little. Yeah, the yeah. I'm fully aware. Yeah, because I don't know how that would keep other other odorants out of your nasal passages, and all of these odorants bind to unique receptors. All right, so it's complicated. It's complicated. I don't see how that works. Uh, you guys want to give an extra couple points of ears to the end? Mm -hmm. Figure it out and tell me on the Wednesday. I'm down with that. You can, you can tell me about um, scent reception and. Tell me something interesting about scent perception. Tell me about that. Yeah, I don't care what you think about this. Man. Something that might throw two to four points on your exam. Who can say? Who can say what I might do? So, 
half page handwritten. Is that fair? Ah, uh, where am I at? Yeah, that'll do. And you gotta keep this in mind when you're parenting as well. Let me explain what the heck I mean by that. I bust up in my kids' rooms back in the day when they were quite small. You never know what they might have been into or in that. Okay? Vomit. Who knows what? Urine. It's parenting. Welcome to that world, okay? So you walk in there and you're like, So what I immediately do is I go clear my nose and breathe through my mouth until I get to approximately where I think the problem is. So I can go, and find it. Does that make sense? Yes. Sense. Ah, <laughs> uh, of course that makes sense. Sense of smell in particular. Ah, uh, <clears throat> so yeah. Yeah, that's how it's all about. Kind of fascinating. Your sense of smell is an interesting thing. All right, cool. Oh, one more comment. The, this is really complicated. Thousands. Of, we can perceive thousands and thousands and thousands of distinct odors. And I mean distinct odors. Distinct, distinct. Back in North Carolina, I wish it, I don't know. I don't know where the hell we found it. Uh, we had these smell pits that would have like 100 vials in them. And, buddy, I'm here to tell you, you could just go down the list and know every single one without trying. Mm -hmm. You're like, baby powder. That's an orange. That's cinnamon. I mean, just all the way down the list, 100 odors, and know every single one of them. Your sense of smell is wild and very interesting, uh, which is why when people lose their sense of smell, they lose a lot, okay? Because a lot of what we perceive as flavor and things that we consume, a lot of it's smell-based, all right? A lot of it's smell-based. That in mind, let's talk about some nuances and then get to flavor. Uh, impulses travel via olfactory tracts to the frontal lobe for our interpretations therein. Uh, and also passing through the hypothalamus, amygdala, and the limbic system, generally speaking. That's a fancy way of saying that smell triggers emotional and physiological responses. Okay? Um, you can smell certain things and your heart will beat faster. You can smell certain things and have a sense of calm come over your system. Like th these are real attributes, okay? absolutely real attributes, and they drive really guttural, primitive responses in a lot of cases. Does this make sense? Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to make jokes. Give me a second. Uh, all right. What's the language? Yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So like with COVID, when we lost, we lost your sense of smell. Yeah. Does that mean that we have like a over influence of like smell? Are you talking about a couch? Is okay, that a short term? Are you asking me a short term question? Yeah, it's like because like. I so if you're around right. the scent for a prolonged period of time, calcium builds up in your receptors and you lose the ability to smell. Yes. So that's kind of what happened during COVID when people lost their sense of smell. No, that's that's virally motivated. We don't really understand that. <laughs> You could write about that as your little paper and tell me why you lose your sense of smell when you have COVID if that is in fact the case. Because what you got to realize is some people lost their sense of smell and other folks didn't. That's a complicated one. Yeah. What would make you lose your sense of taste and not your smell? Uh, that's a solid question. <laughs> like I mean, my grandmother, she there, can't taste, but she can smell. She there could be a whole host of things that could be a lot of things going on. Like, yeah, anything can happen. Any neural integratory issue. Yeah. All those. Like, I'm sure there are people in this world that have got a car accident and lost their sense of taste. Does that make sense? Like, you name it. You name it. There, there are probably lots of random viral interactions. Who can say it? She had a surgery and then after the surgery, uh, she never could taste it. Anymore. Yeah, up in this region of the body? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She had nasal surgery and lost her sense of taste. One of the nervous tracts as well. I would have assumed. That the neural tract for taste would go through the back of the head. But interesting. Hey, welcome to freaking anatomy and physiology, right? So why are we out there? I don't know what that is. That's good. They're talking about. It's so. It's so. But he still got the taste. Yeah. So he still can't taste. Yeah. He would have bit the tip of his tongue off, not the whole thing. No, he, he, he does land on his toes. Oh my god. Yeah, but think about how far you can stick your tongue out to where your teeth would meet that. He didn't get the whole thing. And part two of that conversation would be that the neural tract would be very short there, so the chance of them regrowing would be elevated. 
Like if you cut one of those nerves way up in the top of the head, the chance of it growing all the way back is complicated. So if you're only regrowing, you know, two centimeters, that's good. Right? Right. <laughs> all right. Uh, so let me say this. Your sense of smell tends to drive emotional responses because it passes through your limbic system. Okay? So like grandma's food, comfort food, right? You walk in the building, you're like, ah. Oh. Uh-huh, totally. Or we can keep this between ourselves. I remember about five years ago, I walked into some, I don't even know where the hell I was. I was with, the, with, with my wife. Okay. Walked into some place and someone walked past me and this person was wearing whatever scent it was that one of my ex-girlfriends always wore. <laughs> and buddy, I'm here to tell you, it took me right back to high school. I was like, it'd be like, it was like, pow, pow, you know, and you're like, whoa, like straight back, straight back, because scent is connected to your limbic system, your hypothalamus, your hypothalamus, it is connected with your emotional centers and your memory, it drives emotional and memory-based responses. That is just reality, all right? It's how it works, this is how it works. up with all hands but that getting slapped in the face with like the way that my ex-girlfriend smells is just not good yeah. it's just straight back in time like a freaking time machine man all right yeah oh and uh why do we smell is that the next slide probably and it's probably one of the next slides let's just talk about it why do we smell things there's got to be a reason for everything well, they trace the kind of it, it, it's generally thought of as a sense of gratification or reversion, so things are either good or bad in that sense. Mm -hmm. and that is to say that when we smell foods, we're like, ooh, delicious, I can tell that's good. There's, there's nothing wrong here, this is good for me, I will consume it. Mm -hmm. But you smell, oh man, a little while back, I opened up, uh, I forget what it was, it was a meat-based product, it was ribs, and when I opened it, like it had turned. It was still in date, but it had turned, and it was like, pow, you know what I mean? Right in the face, you're like, Whoa, uh, you could not have, if you had forced me to take a bite, I could not have swallowed it. Does it make sense? Because like, you have this guttural, primitive, deep reaction because this is all traveling through your freaking limbic, limbic, limbic system and your hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is responsible for your digestive activity. You are not swallowing something that smells like it's rotten and gonna die. Does it make sense? Because mm -hmm. your body's trying to avert you away from that. That's what it's for, man. Behind being a poet, or a dog poet, I'll make sure you're chilling. What are you talking about, Keanu? Chilling. 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 Yes, I thought you said chilly for a minute. No, chilling. Uh, I could tell you some fun stories, but thanks. Oh. Let's, keep our, let's keep our time together. And give me time. If we get done a little early, then the one hour I promised you, which is 30 minutes away, um, we'll talk about what's referred to as pig bum. Oh my gosh, the fake, oh fake, gosh. fake, uh, yeah. fake calamari. Yes, artificial calamari. It's fake yeah. calamari. We were like, there were like three of us left in here, and then you started talking. Oh, about it. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Unless yeah. it went us, because that was. Yeah, artificial calamari. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Apparently, it's delicious. It is. Let's go here. Oh, something that animals are vastly more powerful in terms of their sense of smell. You know, and we've got to accept that's reality. Bloodhounds, like legit bloodhounds. <laughs> So we have about 5 million set receptors, they have about 300 million.